this weekend, the latest star-studded Christopher Nolan film blasts its way into theaters. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. If you've seen it, what did you think about Oppenheimer? Also, did you see Oppenheimer or Barbie first? Today is Barbieheimer Day, so I'm very curious which one people decide to go see. Also, if you're a Christopher Nolan fan, I absolutely recommend that you check out the book, The Nolan Variations. The author interviewed Christopher Nolan. It functions kind of like a biography, kind of like a behind the scenes, but also not really, because it has that Christopher Nolan perspective to it. And so it's very much about getting into his mind and understanding how he thinks about cinema. And if you're like me and you like to read with your ears, not your eyes, I'd recommend listening to the audiobook over on Audible, and you can get the Nolan Variations or any other book for free by signing up for a free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. Or you can listen to American Prometheus. That's the book which Oppenheimer is based off of. So if you watch the movie and want to go deeper, you can get it for free at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. I really do recommend Audible, and I really do recommend checking out the Nolan Variations. Let's get started with the good. And if you're unaware, Christopher Nolan is one of my absolute favorite directors. I don't think that he's made a bad movie yet. Some are ambitious but flawed, but I think all of them are worth checking out and have merit. So naturally, him making a movie about the creation of the atom bomb piqued my attention. Whatever movie he does is almost guaranteed to be in my top 10 most anticipated films of the year. And now having seen the film, it's another Christopher Nolan triumph. At its core, it's a character study about this complex man who invented the atom bomb and the toll that that took on him as he realized what he'd unleashed upon the world. And this movie is very dense. It tackles about 30 years of his life. It's told in kind of multiple timelines where you're seeing his kind of rise as an intellectual and a professor and then expert and then part of the Manhattan Project, while it's also kind of telling a story about all of the criticism that he faced in the years after World War II. And the movie's told in black and white and color. And as Nolan describes it, the black and white scenes are intended to be objective and the color scenes are meant to be Oppenheimer's subjective perspective on the events taking place. And despite its complexity and all the characters and all the moving parts, Nolan is able to work his magic and kind of pull it all together. But it's not just the layered story and central character that make this movie complex. It's also emotionally complex in that it's a film where we're essentially racing to create a technology to win the war, to win World War II and stop the Nazis. And so you're rooting for Oppenheimer and his team to succeed, while at the same time having this sense of dread about what's taking place. And this looming idea throughout the entire movie of what will happen if this does get released on the world. And then feeling the regret of being victorious. It's all kind of soaked in it, where the biggest moments of victory in the film, the most beautiful moments of in the film with the spectacle and explosions, also have this sense of dread and they're designed that way. Even just the way that it, it tackles the first test of an atom bomb is done in a way with the use of sound and visuals to kind of make you go, wow, that's incredible. And then at the same time, he finds a way to make it horrifying and shocking and disturbing and remind you of just the might of what has just been unleashed. And it also just does a great job of 
dealing with the ramifications of unleashing this technology in the immediate sense of there's people that worked years of their life to create a bomb. And they're not people that were looking to be responsible for the death of over a hundred thousand people. But that's something that you, they also as humans have to like deal with. They were a part of that. And then even perhaps more importantly, the film deals with the long-term ramifications of as soon as this technology is unleashed, you've added something in the world that is horrifying. And as an audience member, you're like, I feel less safe now having seen this film. I feel actively in danger knowing that Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project put this out into the world. And that's kind of what makes the movie so interesting and compelling that you're rooting for this team to succeed in creating something that's going to create terror in you and make you feel in danger. But as I said earlier, it is a character study of Oppenheimer and kind of diving into this man that his brilliance changed the world, but also it, it doesn't try to just paint him as this perfect hero. It kind of puts his faults, his character flaws on full display where he, he's this womanizer that was a serial adulterer that didn't really value his family. They were, they were kind of an afterthought to him as portrayed in the film. And that um, was very irresponsible and some of the people he associated with in light of everything kind of going on. And so it just treats him as a human. It doesn't romanticize him and or kind of clean off his image. It really confronts the complexity of the fact that he was just as human as all of us and just as conflicted that his motivations in starting this project dramatically started to tr change as he started to realize the implications of what he'd done. The context where he said yes isn't the same context as they completed the mission where the war was at. And you see kind of the toll that takes on him. You see the way that his ego drove a lot of what he did and how it compromised him at times, how it pushed him to succeed at times. And it, 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 it has all these ideas. It never just gives a simple answer. He's like this. And so you take this interesting human, this very interesting man who had ties to communism before the 1950s and invented this technology that had a rise, a fall, and you combined it with one of the most captivating things that's ever happened in human history, one of the most horrifying things that's ever happened in human history, and you merge them together, and just instantly, you have a movie that's interesting. It's not, there's not tons and tons of explosions in this movie. If you're going for the spectacle, it's a three-hour movie that's a lot of people talking in hearings, in Senate committees, in classrooms, in laboratories. It's a very talky movie. There's there are, there's the explosion, there's, there's a little bit of that, but that's not really what the, the movie's about. It's about these characters and the, the events that these geniuses that did, did all of this, but it's compelling because the subject matter is so interesting and it's being told by a master storyteller that's just try, able to give this interesting perspective and tell it in a compl compelling way with all these layers to it. Now, Christopher Nolan has been a top director for quite a while now. So in a certain sense, you kind of know what to expect going into a Nolan film where he likes to mess with time a little bit. He has these layered stories, but he adds kind of a new set of tricks to his repertoire with this film where, as I, I mentioned earlier, there's elements where the black and white are objective scenes and then the color ones are subjective. And to that point, there's multiple times in the movie where it's trying to get you in the mind of Oppenheimer in certain contexts where there's what he's saying and then there's what he's feeling of trying to, well, what's, what's going on deep down inside of him? And Nolan kind of brings in a new bag of tricks in the way that it kind of visualizes these scenes 
and whether it's it's the way that the audio and what's being said doesn't match the imagery that we're seeing. And so just kind of Nolan expanding what he does as a director. As always with a Christopher Nolan film, it's a star-studded cast. And this one of all of his films is just wild and crazy to the degree in which he just assembled this massive, massive team of top tier talent where you'll just have recent Oscar winners in the movie for like four minutes playing this minor character. So everyone's bringing their A game to these incredibly important people in human history. The one that people will probably be talking about the most with this film and have been talking about the most is Robert Downey Jr. And you have to remember with Robert Downey Jr. that 30 years ago, he was perceived of as this top talent of his generation that was go going to go on and do great things. He was nominated for an Oscar for Chaplin. And then he had his struggles with drugs and the law that created this tremendous fall from grace. And people thought his career was over and he was washed up. And of course, of course, of course, he gets cast as Tony Stark. And that's kind of so dominated his career for the last 15 years where he was the star in a franchise filled with stars. And because that's so dominated his career for the last 15 years, it's easy to forget that he's been a top tier actor all along. He's not just great at Tony Stark. He's a great actor. And this is a movie that's gonna remind people of that. Where he's playing this politician that is nothing like Tony Stark or Robert Downey Jr. and transforms into this politician where he's just in hearings and meetings and talking through his looks. And just the right moments of passion is able to show us once again, he's not just a great movie star. He's a great actor. And I'll close out with this. It's a very thought provoking film. Now, I've studied history in the general sense and I'm aware of Oppenheimer, Manhattan Project, the Red Scare, the Cold War. But what this movie does so well is it, it takes all of those things and takes you on the, the journey of an individual a person that had left-leaning tendencies, that had connections to communism long before McCarthy hearings of the 50s. He had some of these connections. And you see how his technology that he created is so much of what created, launched the Cold War that created this fear that so many people faced while it being something that he was doing to stop a different threat. And so it's just like all these layered, complicated ideas of solving one problem, ending one war, leads to the next war. Nothing they do in this movie is in isolation. It's not in a vacuum. A choice made of having an affair has incredible consequences 15, 20 years later. The decision to make this technology affects me today and makes me less safe in a sense today. So once again, Christopher Nolan delivers a tremendous film. One of the most interesting directors working today tackles one of the most interesting people in human history in one of the most important events of human history and the ramifications of all of that. But there's a few more things to talk about with this movie. So let's move on to the mixed aspects of the film. Real quick, I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsor, Bird Dogs. When it comes to clothes, I'm a simple guy. I wanna look amazing and I wanna feel amazing. And that's what Bird Dogs are all about. Their khaki shorts are designed to make you look good by being designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a sculpted look, all while being incredibly comfortable. Bird Dogs fit and feel way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restricting cotton because they invented a cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a slimmer fit while still being able to move around. Now I live in Texas and it is super hot all summer. Bird Dogs are made with an anti-stink sweat 
wicking fabric that keeps me cool and dry all day long. I ordered the Duffy the Vampire Slayers. They arrived in a couple of days. They fit great and they breathe, which is really important in a Texas summer. Go to birddogs.com slash Chandler or enter promo code Chandler for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash Chandler or promo code Chandler for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take your bird dogs off, I promise. From there, let's move on to the mixed aspects of the film. First thing that comes to mind is that this is a different type of film from Nolan, where it is a drama. That's what it is. It's talk heavy. It's Senate hearing heavy. It's not action heavy. And while it's compelling and urgent and you feel so much, if you're going in it to see the spectacle, that's not really what this is. And the other thing to talk about here, and this is a question I've been asked quite a bit since posting my out of the theater reaction to the film, how much sex and nudity are in the film? It's the first R-rated Nolan film in 20 years, and it says because of sexual situations and nudity, so people wanna go see it, but they wanna know, should you go as a family? What does that look like? As I go into this, I want to be as specific as possible, so essentially I will be going into spoilers on this. They're not terribly meaningful spoilers. There are two sequences in the movie that got this rating. The first one is pretty early on in the film where Oppenheimer starts a relationship with Florence Pugh's character, and kind of as soon as they meet, it hard cuts to them having sex, and for half a second you see your boobs and then she starts walking around the room looking at books and you don't see her you can tell she's naked but it's not showing anything and then she grabs a book walks back over to him and the scene ends with another seconds of them clearly beginning to engage in sex again second sequence is kind of more in the middle of the film once the manhattan project has begun and oppenheimer goes back to her for a weekend where it it essentially hard cuts to a scene of the two of them having a conversation where both of them are sitting in chairs naked and the scene is a minute or two long and it's kind of this very meant to be this very vulnerable exposed feeling of them kind of laying it all out there because of this once again you do see her boobs and um it it cuts to close-ups. It's not trying to linger on, hey, look at look at their bodies. Now you know, let's move on to the bad. The big thing here is that there's multiple important relationships that Oppenheimer has in the film that it feels like you never really get a grasp on them. And to that point, you feel like you never really get a hold of certain aspects of who he is and why he's doing specific things. To contrast that, like you very much understand Oppenheimer's relationship with Matt Damon's character, that their respect for each other, that they see the world differently, but you have a good read on what's going on between the two of them in each situation. But with his wife, with Emily Blunt, they're together for most all of this three hour long movie. You see them throughout decades and I didn't feel like I had a grasp on her at all or what was really going on in their marriage. And it seemed like every scene kind of portrayed her in very different lights. Very late in the film, she has her kind of standout sequence during a hearing that she's portrayed in a way that felt kind of out of the blue. It's a great scene and she plays it perfectly and is real satisfying in the movie, but it felt like I haven't seen that version of this person anywhere else in this film. There's little things that happen with them as parents. There's a scene in particular with them with their child where something really like, wow, that was a gigantic thing that just happened, that they just show it, but they don't expand upon the implications of what kind of goes down with their child and what, what they do with the child. That just felt like, if you're gonna put that in the movie, I need to know more about that. I need to understand that more because that's like, that communicates a lot about what's about who these people really are. And you get it more with, with Oppenheimer that he's the person so absorbed in his work that that kind of defines him, that he just lives in his world of work and everything else is for carnal pleasure of, of sorts. But the choice also involves Emily Blunt. 
and never really get a grasp on why she goes along with what kind of happens there. And so there's like this things where there was like a gap, like I didn't feel like I, I got it. I didn't I didn't get a hold of what they were trying to say, what was driving it. And when you have a three hour movie, I don't you don't have any excuses for me to be at the end of it. Like that was really important. And I don't know what you were trying to do with that. That was a lot of runtime in the film that was just showing me something without helping me understand it at all. The other thing is the movie, because it's taking place in these multiple time frames, multiple hearings, all sorts of stuff kind of happening. There's essentially three timelines in the film where you're following through his life. You're seeing these hearings for Oppenheimer and you're seeing hearings for Robert Downey Jr.'s character. And it's not entirely clear why all this stuff with Robert Downey Jr.'s character matters until you get pretty far into the movie. And I don't know what exactly they needed to do to make it clear why they mattered and the implications of it all. I feel like there's probably, I was talking with the person that I went to go see it with and he, he mentioned that there's certain things that they probably should have mentioned and revealed in the beginning of the film to add urgency and weight to those hearings, to add some intrigue, to tickle your brain as to like, what was going on with Oppenheimer? Was he this? Was he responsible for that? They could have introduced some of that stuff in these hearings that make them you pay a lot more attention to those sequences and can frame them in your mind better. And it wouldn't really even be spoiling anything. It just creates an itch in your brain that you want scratched and it's scratched by the end of the film and the, the resolution to it all. So you kind of felt like, I think they needed to find a way to make some of these hearings that set in the fifties more obvious what their importance was earlier on in the film. And finally, I don't know exactly how to say this, but it's a movie that I found maybe more interesting than than emotional. And it, it, it certainly does evoke emotions at certain points in time and especially fear of the world that I now live in because of the events of this film. You absolutely feel that. But because of the nature of the, the characters, perhaps, that... And in, because of the way that it's structured, I felt kind of maybe emotionally distant from a good bit of what was taking place in the film, even when some things probably should have evoked more emotion. So maybe more interesting than emotional. Real quick, before I give you my final score, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. What did you think about Oppenheimer? And did you choose to watch Barbie or Oppenheimer first for Barbieheimer? Also, if you're unaware, I did a series of reviews of all of Christopher Nolan's films, except for Interstellar, which that's coming in the near future. So if you want to know my full thoughts on all of his films, you can check that out in this playlist right up here when this video is over with. When you put it all together, you have one of the most interesting directors today tackling one of the most important events in human history. It's thought provoking. It's challenging. Maybe a few things needed to be ironed out on a couple of details, but another Nolan Triumph. Overall, it's an A- minus on the entertainment scale and 9 out of 10. And this is a movie worth seeing on the big screen. But no, it is a three-hour drama character study, not a big spectacle action film whatsoever. If you enjoyed this video, remember I've done reviews of each of Christopher Nolan's films. You can check them out right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.